I'm high treason. I'll be honest with you, I feel like crap and I'm not in a good mood. So let's just get on with this thing, shall we? There weren't really any platforms left that I didn't already have running. I'm short by two processors, there's been an MP6 I don't care much about, as well as a UMC 4860X, which I do care much about but can't find. I already have machines on those platforms, so it'd be very easy just to drop those chips in if I got them. What I didn't have was a Pentium Pro. Well, the black box you're looking at there had an Athlon in it, but I decided I'd probably never complete that as I can't find a graphics card that I want, and this build's probably going to be the last time I go with a platform I'm not really familiar with unless I get a sudden urge to burn holes in my pocket and play with next-gen chips. I should go a little overboard, I thought. You know, it's probably the last 90s build on my list, I guess. The case is a Zalman Z9. These should still be available on the net somewhere, but I think it's retiring soon if it hasn't already. And the Z11's ugly as fuck. I really don't like gaming cases. This one's surprisingly well constructed, though. Inside the case, the machine may or may not be complete yet. I may, for example, swap the CD drive for a better looking one, as I have a few black ones and I've never had anywhere to use them, really. I might also swap the sound card for an Ensonic soundscape at some point. The hard drive is a Western Digital 15GB drive that's a very unusual size, it's 15 point something gig. It is IDE, there's not much point putting SCSI in here as I'm not going to be putting enough demand on the machine to care for the increased speed. There's a generic 3Com Ethernet card, that's enough said about that, we know what those do. Probably won't run out of those anytime soon either, yeah, check that out. Yeah, chances are we're not going to run out of Sandblaster 1, 2, 8, either. Horrible cards. The graphics card is a Matrox Mystique 220. These cards are quite well known. They're not great in the 3D performance, but they do get the job done, and the more they make up for it with very fast 2D performance and good image quality, which is what I care about more here. It's a PCI card with 4 megabytes of RAM on board, but they could be upgraded to 16 megabytes using headers on the card, or even hooked up to a capture board called the Rainbow Runner via a socket at the back. Remember when you could upgrade everything that way? You know, I miss that. Bloody capitalism. My chosen motherboard is the Chaintech 6 ITM. This came around in 1997 as far as I can tell, but my revision appears to be from after the year 2000, as that's the default date in the BIOS. This board has a rather elaborate voltage regulation set up over there. It seems to be capable of supplying quite a lot of power to the processor, which was important to me, and I'll get into that in a little while. This motherboard is based on the Intel 440FX chipset. These ones were also used in Pentium 2 boards, so are pretty capable chips. They provide a whole lot of PCI and ISA slots, and in my board, six slots for EDO RAM, all of which I have populated with some good RAM I've been saving for no real reason, and I've now realised that I was never going to use it otherwise. The bottom two sticks are 32 megs each, and the four above are 16 megs each, so we have a total of 128 megabytes, officially making this the most EDO RAM I've ever had installed in a single machine. Previous record been 96 megabytes in the Packard Bell just before retirement, but it wasn't enough to get it up to spec. Apparently this board does support more than that. Telltale signs of the times are about, as the board can take ATX and AT power supplies. I'm using an ATX one, as it turns out the AT connector pins are actually connected to the ATX connector, so you could use that to leach power for something if you had one of these. I don't know if any other board does this. Also, this backplane. I've seen a few earlier ATX boards that have this layout, so I'm unsure of which layout the stand started with. Also, rather interestingly, if the seller was being honest, and he seems to be an honest guy, this motherboard was never used prior to me getting it. I have the box and everything, even the little jumper manual sticker for inside the case, which I'm not going to use, but I do miss those. Now, my processor. This footage was shot at a different time, back when the machine was being built, as I've no intention of taking it out of there again, that processor. It's a 200 megahertz Pentium Pro with 1 megabyte of L2 cache. It goes into a socket 8, which is a big bulky socket. These models were known to draw a lot of power and to get hot. Many motherboards, I am told, cannot run them properly. My process is different, however, if only in markings, because on the top it is stamped Q004. 
Yeah, you might actually be able to find one of these because they don't seem that uncommon. And I don't have a normal chip to compare it with, so I don't know if there's any difference internally. Oh, it also says i7 at the start of the number sequence at the bottom, so one could argue I have an i7, just not a real one. Interestingly, the Pentium Pro microarchitecture was capable of four-way symmetrical processing, and it's the ancestor of the original Core and Core 2. It also has PAE, uh, physical address extensions, which allow it to address up to 64 gigabytes of memory, and it was used in the ASCII Red supercomputer which for a time was the most powerful computer in the world. Now this Q-spec number, I'm unclear on exactly what it's saying. I suspect it's a qualification sample due to the Q, as it lacks an ES marking, so it's likely identical, or very nearly identical, to the final chip that you could buy off the shelf. This one would have been sent out to an OEM for them to evaluate the chip and make sure their kit could actually work with it properly, and whether it was worth them ordering any. It also doesn't have a CS marking though, which was customer sample, so who knows? Either way, it works, even if I did have to put some pins on it due to previous owner breaking them off. Moron. Now having seen what some CPU collectors are like, I simply can't resist switching this thing on. Good point. Uh, switching it on. Well, here goes nothing. Well, that sure seems to work. The bias is rather ordinary. It's a ward bias, and it allows you to tamper with what you probably would want to. Also note, we do have USB support and CD-ROM booting, which was a new thing at the time. I have Windows 95 installed, but Pentium Pros weren't really designed for that. They were optimised more for Windows NT4 in workstation environments. In short, they handle 32-bit and floating point a lot better than 16-bit integer code and we will be putting it to the test against the Pentium 200 MHz MMX. The Pro doesn't have MMX instructions but I'm not sure that anything I'm about to test even utilise that so it should be quite fair. From the word go I'm going to show you it against the Pentium 200 in top bench it's going to be the result from the Socket 7 Showdown video. I'm sorry I lost the database I was using then, so I'm having to use old footage here downloaded from YouTube. Thanks Windows 7 for fucking my hard drives up. Seems that the old Pentium was just a little way ahead, but it was using SD RAM and an AGP graphics card. And a faster chipset. Top Bench only tests 16-bit code though, and as time goes on I'm seriously starting to doubt its accuracy now especially on this kind of speed. So I'll come back later with Quake. Remember that Pentium got 42.3 frames per second. Of course, software-wise, it does what any machine from its era would do. We know it well by now, so I won't really go into it. I'll start Duke Nukem 3D, though, just for a second. Must just to demonstrate the Sound Blaster 1 to its MIDI capability. I never much liked the sound of these, and the PCM never sounds right either. I think it's probably because they have to do a hell of a lot of resampling these cards. Not to mention the FM emulation. Now that is fucking awful. The Gravis pulled it off fairly well most of the time by comparison.
I suspect if I get a soundscape, it's going to sound much the same as this Sound Blaster 120 is. These were based on an N-Sonic chip from the N-Sonic Audio PCI. Well, I think that is an insult to the composer's work. And I'm about to do the same, because I reckon I can do better just playing that myself than that N-Sonic chip does. I'll let you know a secret, I can't even play very well with both ends. Let's have a go at it, shall we? The only noteworthy thing about the 128 is it has a lack of an SB link connector because the implementation somehow gets around the limits of the PCI bus. Most other cards such as the Yamaha 724 in my Pentium 2 here required a cable linked to the motherboard to function correctly in DOS games. This cable linked to the chipset and allowed communication with interrupts or some such thing that was otherwise difficult or impossible to do with a PCI card. In short, they made its Sound Blaster compatibility a little bit better. Benchmarking time. Right, quick. Well, I really don't know what to make of it, I have to be honest, because we're going to see that there's only some decimal amount in it. Given the Pentium's faster RAM and GPU, I'm unclear as to which one's actually faster here. Overall, they seem pretty even. I'm inclined to believe we'd see similar results across the board. I may be willing to test it further at a later date as this is inconclusive. I suspect workstation tasks such as CAD might run better on the Pentium Pro. The Pentium Pro was originally intended to replace the Pentium entirely, but it ended up only being used in the server and workstation market. There's not a lot else to say. The Pentium Pro is an oddity to begin with, like a fork of the Pentium line that was forked back out of to bring the Pentium 2 to light and the Pentium 3 before disappearing again only to resurface a shoddy mobile product that turned into an over and unstable desktop product. Ironically, those were great for gaming and shit at everything else. Now, it's probably a dead arc, as the newer core i-chips resemble Netburst more than P6 as far as I can tell. I'd certainly like to hope it was a dead architecture, because really, other than the original Pentium Pro and the Pentium 2, it never worked that well in my opinion. This one is an even further oddity though, simply because of how the hardware was sourced, namely so much new old stock and some dodgy Q-Spec labelled chip that probably isn't meant to be around anymore. One last interesting thing is that the Pentium Pro contains the LT cache on the CPU itself. It's a separate die to the processor, but they're closely linked. The reasons that this is interesting are not only that it was one of the first chips to do this, but also in the fact that the L2 cache is running at the full speed of the CPU, in this case 200 MHz. The Pentium 2 didn't work this way, instead the L2 cache ran at 50% of the CPU clock. The Pentium 2 Xeon which replaced the Pentium Pro though does appear to run its L2 cache at full speed, and those were based on the Shoot's Pentium 2. So that about does it, the Pentium Pro. It's good to have fun with if you're a dedicated collector, but if you just want to run some old games, either a regular Pentium or a Pentium 2 are probably a better choice, and it'll probably cost you a lot less. Not to mention cheaper alternatives like the K6, which is a very flexible chip. All of these were also far better optimised for running DOS games or 16-bit you know, and 32-bit flat applications in general, which leaves a Pentium Pro with no place in this field. CAD and server tasks are probably going to see a bit of a boost over the original Pentium though, if you want to do that with it for some reason. And you can actually install more memory with the correct motherboard using the Pentium Pro, if you're lucky enough to have a motherboard that supports it. I don't. Some of them have SD RAM on, so you can find one of those, it would probably go pretty well actually. Right, well there you go, I usually have this long ass lecture, but I think I just covered that with the 
the voice over there, so I don't really have to say nothing much here. Uh, yeah, thanks for watching. I hope your family's entertaining. For my treason, I'll see you again in the near future, hopefully. Uh, yeah, well, what the hell not. Thanks for watching. Mm, yeah, yeah. good. Anybody who knows me well, I don't know why this is a bit strange. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. One sandwich.